This week's episode of our show is sponsored by the Grim Hollow Valakin Clans Kickstarter, which is bringing two awesome new source books for 5th edition. This Kickstarter is launching on February 15th with two massive books for you to explore the worlds of Grim Hollow. First off, we have The Raider's Guide to Valica. This book is going to be a setting guide to the world of Valica with tons of player options available in it. Not only are there more transformations, the amazing system that was introduced in the Grim Hollow campaign setting, allowing your player characters to transform into new monsters and creatures, but there are also new martial maneuvers and new rules for large-scale combat encounters involving massive raids. We also have the Saga of Seasons, which is a campaign for levels 3 to 11, which spans the length of an entire year, where you get to muster your own clan and survive all four seasons in the world of Valica. This project is brought to you by some of our favorite minds and creators at Ghostfire Gaming, and is sure to be an awesome expansion to the already amazing Grim Hollow campaign setting. So follow the links in the description below to check out the Kickstarter, which is going to be running through late February and into March. And now, onto this week's episode. Greetings! My name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the, the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything TTRPGs, including advice for players and guides for GMs. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Steal yourself and grab your shields, because today we are diving into how to slay a dragon in 5e. Dragons are no doubt the most famous monster in Dungeons and Dragons. They're in the name of the game itself. Dragons come in a variety of different colors and types and do a variety of different damages and have various different ways to thwart their foes. So if you're an adventurer setting out to face a dragon, there's a lot that you need to keep in mind before you go trouncing into their lair with swords drawn. These mystical creatures embody almost everything that we fear in the human psyche about monsters. They are flying, fire-breathing lizards that haunt the skies and human nightmares, hoarding their wealth and power and sitting on a mountain of coins underneath their terrible, terrible lairs. But if there's one thing that I love about stories about dragons, it is the reminder that these great and terrible beasts can in fact be slain. When brave adventurers band together, work together, and just apply a little bit of cunning and know their foe, they can take down even the mightiest of these ancient and terrible beasts. And so today, we're going to discuss how. There's a lot to talk about today, so let's get rolling. Before we dive in, a little bit of a disclaimer. Some of the stuff that we are going to talk about in our tactics and strategies here could be considered a little bit of metagaming because we're going to go into some of the monster statistics and some strategies. This is why it is important that if you want to roleplay it well, you should roleplay your characters seeking out the information about your foes. Perhaps you might consult an ancient tome of dragon slaying knowledge, or band together with other experienced adventurers and find out this information in game. But generally, before you start getting a little meta with these tactics and using these in your games, you might want to find some kind of justification for your character knowing this information before you start using it. I'll also say for the DMs out there watching this video, although this video is about how to slay a dragon, knowing the strengths and weaknesses of your monster could be a really important factor in being able to surprise your party with new ways to imagine the dragon and how they might counter their own weaknesses. So. This video might help out adventurers on preparing to fight a dragon or DMs on preparing their epic encounter with a dragon. So let's get a big overview on what a dragon actually is in 5e. Because there's the creature type dragon, which includes things like wyverns and even some kinds of half dragon and dragonborn and dragon turtles. But then there are the true dragons, which themselves fall into the three categories of the chromatic dragons, the metallic dragons, and the psionic gem dragons. And depending on which dragon you're going to face, these tactics are going to differ a little bit. Each dragon comes packed with their own damage types, damage immunities, and unique layer actions and abilities, all of which make each individual dragon a different sort of threat. But no matter what, they're all scary. And there are commonalities between them all. However, a unique element about dragonkind 
is that they have adapted to almost every type of environment. You can encounter red dragons in mountains and volcanic regions. You can encounter black dragons in swamps, green dragons in forests, blue dragons in the desert, and white dragons in the tundras and arctic regions, to say nothing of all the metallic and gem dragons which have their own unique habitats. Now, many dragons are often categorized also based on their alignment, with chromatic dragons being traditionally evil, and metallic dragons being traditionally good, and gem dragons kind of being more neutral. However, this might not be the case in your setting. The Eberron setting, for example, is one world where dragons of any color and any type can be of any alignment, and certainly dragons may not follow these sort of hard and fast rules. So you never know when your character might unexpectedly find themselves up against a metallic or gem dragon, even if uh, you are serving this cause of good. I'll also say that no matter what dragon you're facing, even if you have one that is aligned good, I still think that all dragons are relatively intimidating. They have their own agendas, they have their own goals, and even a good dragon might not want you in its way for various reasons. So standing up to a dragon or going to even try to make a deal with a dragon regardless of their alignment is a very intimidating task and you always want to be prepared for the chance that that dragon could just choose to eat you even if you're both on the same side dragons are intelligent and capricious foes but they have a huge array of deadly abilities you might find that contending with the dragon's intelligence and planning is enough of a challenge, but when the chips are down and it comes time to actually slay that dragon in combat, it is a fearsome opponent with some very, very show-stopping abilities. No matter what type of dragon you're facing, they are all excellent damage dealers. Pairing that with a really high AC, a boatload of hit points, and also some of the older dragons will have abilities like legendary actions, legendary resistance, and even innate spell casting that leaves them with several tricks up their sleeves to thwart their enemies. These tricks, along with the dragon's intelligence, means that there's always going to be some measure of unknown when you go in for, to facing a dragon, especially adult and ancient dragons. You need to go into it with the mindset that this dragon has defeated adventurers before. It has slain adventurers before, and it knows what to expect from adventurers. So it is always going to have some kind of unique trick, probably something that you might not even be able to predict, no matter how much research or preparation you have going into it. However, there are three things that you need to be absolutely prepared for, even if you are facing inexperienced or young dragons that do not have the bevy of century or millennia of experience of their older parents and cousins. First off is their aerial mobility. Every dragon has the ability to fly, and a flying creature is very dangerous to encounter. It gives them a sort of maneuverability on the battlefield that not all enemies have. So when an adventuring party is stepping up to a dragon, that dragon can take to the air, attack from afar, or get up close, take a few swipes, and then get back into the air where it can't be as easily hit. Beyond its aerial mobility, dragons often have resistances, immunities, and other movement modes, which can even include climb, burrow, and swimming speeds, which might allow the dragons to move in unpredictable ways despite being such large and imposing creatures. Black dragons are famous for their ability to make diving attacks coming out from the swamp water and taking to the air, meaning that they are just as adept fighting underwater as they are in the sky. Next up, every dragon has a deadly breath attack. Whether you're being hit with the fire breath of a red dragon, the lightning breath of a blue dragon, or any of the other damage types that come with the various colors of dragons out there, there's basically a dragon that can do every type of damage in the game. And that means that knowing which dragon you're going up against is going to be crucial for surviving. Dragon's breath weapons often involve the dungeon master rolling a bucket load of dice. And oftentimes a dragon's breath weapon can do enough damage to potentially even one shot a player character of, of even close level to the challenge rating of the dragon 
if they don't have a great hit points or are especially vulnerable to that damage type. What's worse is that many dragons also have special breath weapons that can incapacitate, stun, blind, and all that fun stuff. So if you are going up against gem dragons or metallic dragons, you need to be especially prepared for those breath weapons to involve rare damage types and other unique status conditions that may make it even worse for you. And lastly, if you're going to face a dragon, every dragon has its lair. And its lair is more than just its home. It is its hunting ground. It knows its lair. It knows how to defeat its prey in its lair. There are lair actions and lair abilities that a lot of dragons have access to. So going off wandering into a dragon's lair with the hopes that you're going to face it without being properly prepared could mean certain death for the entire party. A dragon will often have thought about all the different ways that its lair could potentially be attacked. And dragons may have secret entrances to their lairs that are only accessible for the dragon, such as entrances that only allow a flying or swimming creature to get in, or in fact, might require you to swim through lava, which a red dragon can do. In addition, a dragon may have a variety of minions or perhaps even its own brood of young children <laughs> that are acting as spies, informants, or guardians around the lair itself, but also the surrounding environs. If you're approaching within a couple miles of a dragon's lair, you should basically take it as a guarantee that the dragon knows that you have encroached on its territory already. If you are assuming that you are going to be able to approach that dragon's lair with any form of surprising that dragon, you're going to be disappointed. The dragon probably knows you're coming unless you have taken extensive steps to make sure that the dragon doesn't know that you're coming. And talking about that, as we move on to the fatal mistakes that you can make as a party when going to face a dragon, the first one is about expecting that you can stealth your way into a dragon's lair. Because dragons have some key abilities that are going to make it even more hard. More so than just the fact that they're fully aware of their lair and all the different ways adventurers might approach their lair. Beyond all of that, dragons will almost always have incredibly high perception or some form of blind sight or dark vision. This means that sneaking up on a dragon is incredibly unlikely. Parties who rely on stealth and think they can sneak up and surprise the dragon are going to be sorely mistaken and oftentimes a good DM knows that the dragon is already aware of their presence and is already setting up an ambush for the party. As the party is sneaking in trying to get the drop on the dragon, the dragon might be clinging to the ceiling, watching them already planning its attack. And if you think that you are sne sneaking up on that sleeping dragon, I'm sorry to say, but you're already dead. Now, as you're sneaking into the dragon's lair, hoping to surprise it, which is your first fatal mistake, your next fatal mistake might be expecting that you can get the dragon into melee combat and have it stay there. Dragons, again, are aerial creatures. And with their breath attack, and some of them with innate spell casting, or able to use wing attacks, or various things that they can do from slightly further away, they're more likely to spend their time in the air where they're harder to hit, waiting for their breath weapon to come back so that they can breathe fire across the entire party. This is the normal tactic for most dragons, and they would rather do that than land and start swiping at you with their claws, which if they do, it's still going to hurt a lot. But thinking that you can rely on melee combat is going to be a fatal mistake. Dragons will often lair in cavernous spaces that facilitate their ability to fly around. Dragons choose their lairs so that they have areas to fly around and that they can move through them and navigate them. And a dragon knows its lair like the back of its claws. In fact, most dragons have probably memorized the position of every single coin in their treasure pile. So they have a level of awareness happening that you need to be considerate of when you are attacking. 
A common tactic for adventuring parties is to stick together and fight as a unified force. And although you will want to fight as a unified force, sticking together is a fatal mistake. The breath attack is the most deadly attack that a dragon can make. And if you are all standing in a line or in a group, that breath attack can hit all of you and oftentimes take out one, two, or even three party members or more. You can get an entire party wipe with a single breath attack. For that reason, if you're thinking of sticking together, this is actually one of those times that spreading out and attacking from different angles is going to be very crucial for a party who wants to survive in a dragon's lair. We'll talk about this more in the strategy section, but consider all the different angles that a dragon can approach from. Because it's an aerial combatant, a dragon is able to reposition itself on its turn to find the optimal angle to catch as many enemies in its breath weapon as it possibly can. So don't necessarily think that just because your position seems like from the dragon's current position that you're spread out, that the dragon isn't capable of finding another location to move to where it will be able to hit your entire party with its breath weapon because its breath weapon combined with its aerial mobility makes for a really deadly combination. And if dragons are faced with a group of melee combatants, they will simply strafe them, never land, and just roast them, fry them, freeze them, melt them, whatever it is, until their foes are simply dead. The last fatal mistake that you can make is probably the one that you need to prepare for before any of these other ones, and that is approaching the dragon's lair itself. Again, there, are, there is a chance that you're wandering into a dragon's lair and you don't even know it, in which case, good luck. That's a very dangerous situation. <laughs> but if you are purposefully hunting a dragon, and I find most of the times in our D&D games, dragons are not secretive in their presence. Sometimes they can be, but usually you get a quest along the lines of, oh no, a dragon's been eating all the livestock and burnt down a nearby village. Somebody mm -hmm. needs to do something. So if you are aware that you're going to be heading to the dragon's lair, don't just go trouncing into their lair. Now's the time to start preparing, to start getting ready for this adventure. Now might be a t good time to gear up on magic items or potions or scrolls, prepare the proper spells, and actually scout and learn about the surrounding area around the dragon. Because if you just go wandering straight into their lair like you would on an, any other adventure, you're putting yourself at a disadvantage. I think the other final the other final fatal mistake is expecting the dragon to behave like an animal, which it is not. A dragon is a highly intelligent and often experienced predator that knows what it means to fight adventurers and would-be dragon slayers. Underestimating the dragon's intelligence is probably the biggest fatal mistake that an adventuring party can make. Oftentimes, would-be dragon slayers start devising traps or schemes that they think might fool a dragon, but dragons aren't fools. That's not to say that you shouldn't plan a dragon. It's just that your plan needs to go one or two steps ahead and start thinking about how the dragon might be prepared for your strategy. This is particularly true if you're trying to coax a dragon out of its lair. A dragon might not necessarily be lured out of its lair by food, for instance. You might need a little bit more than that to garner their attention, particularly if you have hostile intentions towards that dragon. So now you're aware of all of the possible ways that you could die horribly when going to face a dragon. So how are you going to prepare for your adventure? So getting prepared, we're going to want to talk about the gear and equipment you might want to bring along, mm. the different spells you may want to pack, and some different abilities or feats that might come in handy for an adventuring party who's going up against a dragon. First, let's talk about essential gear. Bringing the right gear is one of the first ways that you can level the playing field against the dragon. Because we've already talked about the dragon's intelligence is kind of the X factor here. It's very hard to plan for that. But the dragon's aerial mobility, its elemental attacks, are things that you know it will have, and so those are things that you can plan for. So the very first thing is be prepared for the fact that you're gonna have to fight a ranged foe. 
Uh, and one of the simplest ways to deal with that is to bring some ranged weapons. If you're that fighter who doesn't have a lot of ranged attacks, now's the time to go grab a pile of javelins, some hand axes, anything that you can throw at the dragon because you may be relying on those. Get your crossbow bolts and your arrows and your ranged spells. All of that is going to be key for facing a dragon. Don't expect melee combat. At the same time, don't bring firebolt and fireball against a red dragon. <laughs> So make sure that you're bringing ranged attacks, particularly spells with the right elemental type. And if you have access to magic weapons, keep that in mind as well. Maybe there's an opportunity to get a javelin of lightning or some magically tipped arrows or bolts. These sorts of magic items that rely on ranged attacks are going to be crucial for going up against the dragon. On top of that, though, there are a lot of magic items, potions, and scrolls that may lend themselves towards offering resistance. There's magic armor or shields out there that can help out with resistances. And there's lots of potions out there for different types of resistances. When you're buying those items though, you definitely want to know what type of dragon you're going up against so that you're not buying a fire resistance potion to go up against a blue dragon. That's not really going to help. So know your enemy first and then buy the appropriate resistance potions to face that foe. A single potion of resistance can do more for you than an entire jug of healing potions can up against a dragon. And I particularly think that potions of resistance or armor that grants resistance or immunity to the elemental attacks are definitely more favorable than spells such as that, that are gonna grant you energy resistance. And there's a big reason for this. A potion is not going to go away because you failed a concentration check. And a dragon's breath weapon does so much damage that even on a successful save that is halved, it can be enough damage to force you to have to make a concentration check, which means that sure, you might've been protected for that first go of the breath weapon, but you might have to survive that breath weapon more than once. And if your spell goes down, recasting it in the middle of combat is not a good thing to have to do. And by and large, your concentration is far more valuable on the spells that are going to help you with other advantages that are a little bit harder to get than, say, resistance. Before we get into the spells, though, in terms of gear that you might look for, any magic item that can grant flying, this includes potions or a magic carpet or boots of flying or wings of flying, there's a lot of options out there for gaining flight. Interestingly enough, Flight might be better reserved for your melee combatants and not your ranged attackers. Usually in a combat encounter, it's the other way around, where you want your spellcasters, your rangers, and your rogues in the air to pepper arrows and spells down upon your enemies. But when facing a dragon, you might want to untie those boots of flying and hand them over to the barbarian so that the barbarian can fly up to the dragon and attack it with everything it has while the ranged attackers stay spread out on the ground firing up towards the dragon. You do not want to get into an aerial dogfight with a dragon. That is a fight you are definitely going to lose, especially if you are a spellcaster or an archer. A flying archer is easily the number one target for a dragon in any sort of combat encounter, and oftentimes spellcasters and archers just do not have the resilience to withstand either the breath weapon or the melee assault of a dragon. In a similar token, there is one type of flight that you really want to avoid bringing against a dragon, and that's a flying mount. <laughs> Dragons love roasting griffins, pegasi, hippogriffs, F giant eagles. All of these types of things are very poor choices against the aerial superiority of a dragon. If your flying mount will get so many accessible flying mounts, will just get one shot by the breath weapon of a dragon. And so I would leave the mounts at home. So what about the spellcasters? Now that the melee combatants have all of their magic gear and their magic arrows and are setting up to fight this dragon, spellcasters, what spells should you be packing if you're planning to face a dragon? Whether you've leveled up recently and are picking new spells, or if you're a wizard or cleric who's able to switch out which spells they're packing for the day, 
What should you bring? Obviously, the fly spell seems like a good candidate, but once again, the fly spell can be a vulnerability point in your party. Dragons know magic. They are familiar with it. And if they see that you are flying around and concentrating on a spell, they might just go for the character that's concentrating on the fly spell, and that's now going to bring everyone down to the ground. So while it can be good to bring fly for emergencies, like concentrating on a spell that grants you energy resistance, these can be liabilities that you want something a little bit more reliable for. By a similar token, dragons have great saving throws almost across the board. Dragons have great strength, constitution, wisdom, and charisma saving throws, and the older dragons have legendary resistance and may even have magic resistance to boot. In general, a dragon's weakest saves are usually dexterity and intelligence, but their saves are still good. <laughs> So that's not saying much. Weakest save means that you're still going to have to fight to land those crucial spells. Although fly might be a weak point or really any spell that you need to concentrate on that could be a weak link for your party, if the dragon has legendary resistance, bolstering the party might be the best option. Because landing those spells, you're going to have to burn through several spells to get through the legendary resistance before you can actually impact the dragon. So perhaps packing something like Fly or Haste or even Polymorph, which can turn the Barbarian into a giant eagle, or if you can get the dragon close to the ground, if you can make a T-Rex fight a dragon, that's usually going to be a great epic scene. But... These spells can be knocked out if the spellcaster gets hit hard enough, and that's where that weak point is. If you are going to target the dragon, I think that control spells, spells that can incapacitate, knock prone, or stun a dragon are going to be crucial. I've seen a younger dragon taken out by a spell like web, which stuck them to the ground and allowed the whole party to just wail on them. Or something like hypnotic pattern or... Cold monster can do wonders against a dragon. Anything that you can use that can bring the dragon down to earth or incapacitate it are going to be crucial for defeating it. But remember again that you might need to blow a lot of spell slots to get one of those to land. This is why I really like Telekinesis and Bigby's Hand against dragons. Both of these spells rely on ability checks to hold on to the dragon with a grab. And so these spells can be really, really effective if the dragon is, is close to the ground or has been grounded and using telekinesis or Bigby's hand to grab that dragon and hold them on the ground so that your melee combatants can take that opportunity now with advantage can really turn the tide of battle. Similarly, Kelly mentioned web, but even black tentacles can do a really good job of this too. Um, these are all spells that, while they do involve saving throws, they often involve the dragon having to make an opposed ability check. And dragons can't use their legendary resistance for that, and it does also mitigate their straight saving throws. Now, dragons are still strong. They still have a good chance of breaking out of these sorts of things, but I find that these spells because of the specific way that they're worded, give you, give you a really key advantage in trapping that dragon and limiting its mobility. I will also say that in terms of resistances, again, having resistance to the right damage type can be crucial, but some spells that offer energy resistance may be better spent before the battle begins. If you can properly prepare and you're about to go into battle and you're able to drop fire resistance on your party somehow, mm -hmm. then that might be great. But in the middle of battle, you might not have the time to spend casting those sorts of spells. It's worth noting that spells like Fire Shield can give you fire or cold resistance concentration free. And Hero's Feast is a pretty big slam dunk against any dragon that relies on poison. <laughs> And lastly, when you are preparing your spells, it goes without saying, but don't pack the wrong damage type to face the dragon. <laughs> don't pack Fireball and Firebolt against the red dragon. Figure out what dragon you're going to be facing and pack something else because you don't want to mix and match the wrong damage type against the wrong dragon. It is also worth mentioning that dragons themselves have knowledge of magic and may have innate magical abilities. And I have run into dragons that know Dispel Magic and Counterspell. 
<laughs> so watch out. The dragon might have its own magic tricks up its sleeve as well, and some dragons can be very powerful spellcasters in their own right. When we move on to some of the key class features that you might be able to get for facing a dragon, the first ones that come to mind are the Battlemaster and the Monk. The Battlemaster has Trip Attack, which is just an excellent way of knocking a flying creature prone. If a flying creature falls prone, they fall to the ground. This means that a fighter with a javelin can actually knock a dragon out of the air. That could be a game-changing move. Similarly, if the monk can land Stunning Strike, again, be aware of legendary resistance, but a landed Stunning Strike on a dragon could end the combat encounter real quick. Stunning Strike is one of the perfect ways to blow through a dragon's legendary resistance because the stakes are very high. A dragon cannot afford to get stunned, and even though it has a great constitution saving throw, if you do have a monk in your party, it's it's a they just can't afford to fail. They, they, they have to use their legendary resistance against it. And once they burn through them all, they're now vulnerable to a whole bunch of other tricks that your party might pull on them. Once the dragon is grounded, keeping them there is critical. And you can do this with spells, but the sentinel feat is another one that is really, really key for keeping the dragon on the ground because it just reduces their movement speed to zero. It's just, you're not getting away. <laughs> I've had a paladin with sentinel kill a dragon pretty quickly. And paladins are great because they also have their aura of protection. But there is a pro and a con here with aura of protection. The bonuses to the saving throws for your whole party is going to be excellent, but it requires the whole party sticking close to the paladin. And so you have to pick and choose. Perhaps getting one or two of the weaker characters nestled in with the paladin while the other stronger characters are dividing and conquer maybe but even then you're putting the weak characters in line of fire to get roasted with the paladin so it's kind of hard to say what the proper play there is the aura of protection great to have in your party but sticking together not great against a dragon yeah you gotta weigh it carefully if you're in a situation where you might not be able to control the dragon's mobility and it's gonna find the angle to breathe fire, acid, poison on your entire party no matter what, then fine. Bunch up, aura protection will ha help you there. If you get four party members all together and you could have had two party members over here and two over here, it would have been better for you to be separated even with the bonus to the saving throws um, in terms of the amount of damage that you could have prevented. Again, it's going to depend on all the specifics of your party, but bear that in mind. Another ability that can be really helpful is evasion, which will help have the damage or avoid the damage of the breath weapon entirely but remember that evasion only applies to dexterity saving throws so you rogues out there if you're going up against a white dragon or a green dragon or a black dragon your evasion is not going to save you from their breath weapon i can't tell tell you how many times i have turned a rogue into a popsicle with a white dragon's breath weapon because they thought that the cold damage was a dexterity saving throw it's a constitution saving throw. Now that you have geared up and are prepared to face the dragon, what strategies are you going to bring into play once initiative is rolled? We've talked about this a lot, so I will start with this and reiterate it again. Dividing and conquering is going to be crucial. Grouping together is not your best strategy. Look for the angles, look for the ways that you can get into advantageous positions that are far enough away that the dragon can't just burn you all with a breath attack. Oddly enough, dragon breath attacks are either a line or a cone. If it's a line, it's actually a little bit easier to divide out. You can usually get into a situation where only two creatures can be hit with a line. Cones are more deadly and interesting. The closer you are to the dragon, the less likely it is to be able to hit a lot of targets with the cone. So if you can spread out on multiple different angles around the dragon close to it, it is now going to have to choose which direction to breathe that breath attack in. Bear in mind, though, that this strategy only works if you can reliably prevent the dragon from moving. And if you can't, the dragon is simply going to move, 
reposition, and breathe fire again. And some dragons have legendary actions that allow them to move out of turn while avoiding opportunity attacks at the same time or potentially mitigating your ability to, to make opportunity attacks against them as part of that movement. So you need before you all bunch up close to the dragon hoping that it's not going to breathe on one side or the other, you better make sure that it's not going to be able to reposition because otherwise it will <laughs> and you will be roasted. <laughs> the, that's the interesting point is surrounding a dragon seems like you're spread out until the dragon simply lifts up and moves back and now you're all in a group. And once again, some dragons do have abilities that will allow them through legendary actions to move out of turn and potentially avoid opportunity attacks as well. Gem dragons can teleport. Some dragons might have innate spellcasting abilities that will let them teleport as well. So you do have to be aware of all that supreme mobility the dragon can potentially have. Again, though, if you can negate the aerial advantage and you can prepare for the breath weapon and you are ready to take on the physical damage it can deal in melee, you will have negated the physical abilities of that dragon. And now you're going to have to be ready for whatever other dirty tricks it has up its sleeve. And unfortunately, you might not be able to prepare for those things. And that's why having this strategy in place to deal with the things that you know the dragon is going to do is kind of like just getting in your getting your foot in the door. Um, I think that the, that the other winning strategy that you should have in this respect is even though it can be dangerous, scouting the dragon's lair is going to give you a really key glimpse as to what surprises might be waiting for you. No matter how much prep you do, the dragon will usually have some form of an advantage in its home territory. As we mentioned earlier, stealth might not be an efficient strategy for getting information about the dragon's lair, but that doesn't mean that there isn't room for subtlety here. You might be able to find out a great deal about the dragon's lair by interrogating or capturing its minions. By a similar token, you might not be able to lure the dragon out of its lair with food, but dragons are arrogant, if nothing else. And one of the most effective ways to trick a dragon is to make it seem like you are surrendering to it. Dragons love tribute. They love being offered treasure. They, they love it when mortals grovel and beg at their feet. And this arrogance is a weakness that you can exploit. A dragon might not let you anywhere near its lair if it thinks that you're coming to slay it, but it might let you right into the belly of the beast if it thinks that you're bringing it a gift. A dragon might be completely unwilling to leave its lair to get a good dinner, but it might be completely willing to leave its lair if the king is offering to bow down before the dragon in the middle of the town square. That is the types of traps that work on dragons, the ones that prey on their avarice and their arrogance, not the ones that treat them like animals, but ones that treat them like villains. And for that reason, I think that dragons not only offer an incredibly interesting combat encounter and adventure, but also come packed with great social encounter options as well. There may be more than one way to defeat a dragon, perhaps cutting a deal with it, or finding out what the dragon wants, or what the dragon loves. What is it hoarding? Perhaps it hoards magic items and treasure, and going with offers of magic items might be enough to get the edge on the dragon. Dragons offer such a unique and interesting adventure idea that there's a reason why they're the most iconic monster in all of the Dungeons & Dragons mythos. One other thing that you can do to really confound a dragon is to use its experience against it. Employ a decoy strategy that is stupidly obvious, something that the dragon is like, I have seen this be before. Get it to underestimate you. Make it think that it's one of the predictable scenarios that it's seen from foolish adventurers dozens of times before. If you can mask your true strategy beneath the veneer of just being bumbling idiot adventurers, 
you might be able to play on the dragon's own intelligence and use that against them. So if you've slayed many dragons in your days, tell us about your best strategies for how to slay a dragon in the comments below. The videos that we create on our channel are made possible with thanks to the incredible generosity of our Patreon supporters. If you enjoy the work that we do here on YouTube, please consider supporting the channel by following the links in the description below. And don't forget to check out our actual play campaign in the Worlds of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday evenings on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And we've got plenty more videos about the monsters of the Worlds of 5th Edition right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel, like this video, and ring that bell so that you never miss an episode. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time in, in the, the dungeon. dungeon.